in. Move to the center of the row. Make sure that you get every single seat filled. We want to make sure that we have enough room for everybody to get in. We want to make sure that everybody gets a seat. Get close. Get friendly. This is DEF CON. Make friends. Are some of the things that I wish I could be telling you right now. Unfortunately, yeah, we can't. I'm here and you guys are where you're at, respectively. So, um... With that said, we forge on, and the second year of the AppSec Village continues on. For this talk, we've got uh, Pedro Umberlino and Joao Maurice uh, to talk about bug foraging in Android. Uh, Pedro is a security researcher by day and a Hackaday contributor by night. He messes around with computers, started on the spectrum, he's been through the bulletin board age, He's been there for the drop of the internet and still roams around on IRC. He's known on the internet by his handle, Cryptor, and he likes all sorts of hacks. Um, Jao is a penetration tester and researcher that started with the blue team, later was attracted to the red side of the force. Uh, although there's more focused in application security, he's learned all sorts of attack vectors. So if you would take some time, Sit back, enjoy the talk, and help me in welcoming these two fantastic presenters. Hello, and welcome to the Android bug foraging session. It's great to be here at DEF CON Safe Mode AppSec Village giving this talk, despite everything that's happening. It's really good to see the community coming together and make sure this kind of events still happen. Uh, my name is Pedro Mbolino. I'm a senior security researcher at Checkmark Security Research Team. Uh, I'm also a security researcher at Chair49, sometimes I write for Hackaday. Uh, one of my hobbies is to make hardware and my daytime job is to break software. I'm giving this talk with a friend of mine and colleague, João. João? Thank you, Pedro. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. My name is João Moraes. I'm a penetration tester team lead for a multinational company. But I also do pen testing and security research for other companies. I'm part of the check marks and Sharp 49 security research team. So my background is very wide. I did many different things over the years, always related to security though. But in the last years, I've been more focused in application security and mobile security, which is ex exactly what we brought here today for you. So, yeah, I will hand over the mic to Pedro now so that he can talk to you a little bit about this bug foraging concept. Thanks, Ron. So, foraging. Foraging, the act of identifying and gathering wild food in nature. Uh, bug foraging is like kind of the same, uh, but you're not in nature, you're in the Android ecosystem, you're not hunting bugs to eat, but you eat because you hunt bugs. So. Yeah, it's not the same, but y you know, you get the idea. Uh, so our motivation to, to do this talk, uh, we wanted to, instead of having like a theoretical approach and, you know, shared back practices in, in Android development and so forth, we wanted to share our real life uh, examples of vulnerabilities that we found in our analysis. Uh, we wanted to share with you our, our process of uh, approaching and devising uh, meaningful attack scenarios and proof of concepts. And in a nutshell, the, the overall experience that, that you, we, we have from first crash uh, until disclosure process. And for that, we are going to, to use uh, four different uh, examples of vulnerabilities in different in four different apps that, that we, we found. Uh, some of them are, are from our older work and some of them are going to be uh, disclosed here uh, firsthand. So Jean is going to talk a bit about uh, which vulnerabilities we are going to talk about. So Joao. Thank you, Pedro. We're moving on to the agenda. We're going to present to you four cases, starting with Tinder, the app X, which is an app that we cannot say its real name, Google Camera, and Samsung Find My Mobile, the two really well-known apps in the Android world. And then final words, the main key takeaways from this bug for aging experience. Moving on to case one, the Tinder application. This is a very well-known application that allows you to meet people and chat with them. Uh, the only basic knowledge you need to have about this application is that it will show you pictures of people and you can swipe left or swipe right and you'll actually be saying that you like them or dislike them. And if they like you back, you'll have a match and then you can chat with them using the application. 
Well, so let's start with uh, what we did. We started by sniffing and collecting the traffic and we could see a lot of HTTP going on. HTTP would allow us immediately to know that a certain IP and MAC address was using the application and also allowed us to know more. It allowed us to match images with user IDs because you can see there in green that is actually the user ID that is shown in the URL. Also the image resolution is present you can see in yellow and will allow you to know if that image belongs to the user of the app or someone who's the victim, let's call it victim, is chatting with. And also allows you to see other users, so they are in the discovery, so other users that are being suggested to you for you to like or dislike them. So now we have a good visibility, a good invasion of privacy, but going a little bit deeper, we can see that in the HTTPS replies from the API, that's why you see the 443 port in the source, that's actually the reply from the API, and you can see that the size of the payload is very different, and that changes accordingly to the actions of the user. So we could do a direct match between the actions of the user and the size of the payload. Of course, we put more 10 or 20 bytes in our parser, but it was around 278 for a nope, 374 for a like, and 581 for a match. So now we could put all of this together and we ended up with this application, the Tinder Drift, which is based or inspired in the DriftNet. And if you have a, a man-in-the-middle attack going on, or if you have some sort of access to the traffic in your network, you could easily identify users of the Tinder application, their MAC address and IP. You could see all the pictures. You can see their picture on the top left. You can see in the center the pictures of users that are being suggested. Uh, so they are being shown in his device and also his actions, the nopes, the likes and the matches. We also put some traffic down below for debugging purposes. But you can see this working now in this quick video. This video is the Tinder Drift software demo. Tinder Drift was inspired by DriftNet and is a software that passively analyzes network traffic and is able to identify and profile uh, Tinder app clients. So let's start the Tinder Drift for the demo. This is the app right here. Uh, it receives a pickup file, it can be a live pickup and it still analyzes it. So on our mobile phone we are starting Tinder and after a while you can see that he already de detected that the, which image am I seeing. So Tinder Drift takes advantage of the fact that uh, the Tinder app fetches profile images via a non-encrypted HTTP connection and it associates that image or those images to a client. After that, it analyzes the HTTPS encrypted connections from the client to the Tinder API server and infers the behavior of the client by the size of the server responses to that request. So when the user swipes left or right, uh, the app sends a request to the API server. The reply packet size can be used to determine which kind of action the user took, if it's a like, a didn't like, or even if it's a like and it's a match, or if it's a super like. Uh, so you can see that uh, it takes some time to stabilize, and after after that, the software is able to identify which action the user took. For example, let's like this profile. Uh, when you swipe like, you can see here in this corner that the image was properly identified as a like. And if it's a no like, it's a nope. So let's like this also. So, and you can see that the app updates uh, the software also supports multiple clients. For example, let's switch to an iPhone. The corporate response was quite fast, but they didn't consider this a big deal in the beginning. 
This ended up in the news. A massive media storm came that culminated with a U.S. senator saying publicly that Tinder was vulnerable. And, of course, that led to a very quick fix, and that was very positive. Um, there was no bounty, because at the time, as, as far as I recall, there was no bug bounty program. Let's move on to case two, the app X. This is not really its name, it's just a name we made up, because we are not allowed to say its name legally, we, we can't do it. But that won't be relevant um, for explaining the vulnerabilities. So let's move on. Um, starting with what we did, uh, we started by listing activities that could be used by other applications. And we found out that the main activity can actually load a malicious URL. And that's because there is some link validation, but it's not very strong. I mean, you can see the regex down there. If you have a slash, a L, L character and a slash, your, your link is valid. And it will be loaded by the web view. So you'll end up with something like this. If you have a, an attacking application, it can create an intent that will then open the app X, which will then load your malicious content in the web view. We tested that with the activity manager using ADP and it works. So we did actually create an attacking application and we did as well create uh, an HTML page which was exactly the same as the original login page for the app. So a user would not be able to distinguish between the original web page for logging in and our malicious page for logging in and we could steal the credentials and the application would still work smoothlessly. We tried to leverage these findings. We looked for other things and we found several JavaScript interfaces. As you know, a JavaScript interface is an export of a native Java function and allows the JavaScript in your web view to use it. And this particular set base URLs function allows you to change the URL of the API. And we can replace it with our own URL. And when you do that, this change is permanent. Your application will contact our malicious API instead of the original API. The app has certificate pinning and it works well, but it also supports plain HTTP. So we can actually use an HTTP URL and the same with the official API that works either in HTTPS or plain HTTP. So this was the perfect scenario for a man in the middle attack, although we still need to trick the victim into install a malicious app. So we tried to go deeper. We saw there were some deep links for this app. Let's consider this scheme. Of course, it's not the real scheme, the app X, just for clarity. And there is a messaging system in the application. So we were trying to think of a way to send a link in which we could exploit this exactly in the same way, but without requiring a, requiring a malicious application. So the chat feature doesn't support deep links, but it supports regular web links. And we could actually send a regular web link. Uh, the browser would open it. We could redirect to a deep link to the Apex schema. But how would we pass the parameter then to the main activity? I mean, the main activity would open but it would use the default HTML content and we wanted to be able to pass it our malicious URL. So we ended up with something like this. This is the full chain of events. You can see down there the full URI for the exploit. The app X will open the application and the AF underscore DP parameter will allow us to inject that HTML in the web view. But let's start from the beginning. So we don't need a malicious application anymore. We just need a message. And we'll send a message with a web link. As soon as the user opens the link, Google Chrome is called. It will request a malicious page to our server. And our server will redirect to that full URI that you see down there. So then the Android knows that AppX scheme. It will open the AppX application. And the Apex application will load our 
http attacking.site.com of course that's a fake domain just for demonstration purposes you can see the slash l slash so that it will pass the validation and this will work we have the full exploit just like we did before but without requiring a malicious application now the af underscore dp parameter is something that we found via reverse engineering and you can see there its content will be loaded in the web view so summing this up uh, when the victim clicks in the link the attacker can steal its cookies impersonate so take over account monitor all the application activity read private messages you can track the victim to its geographic location because the app has this feature and it can also create a wormable exploit well where all the contacts will receive a malicious link and by each contact that presses on the link it will send it to all the uh, contacts of that uh, contact and so on and so on so becoming a sort of a wormable uh, exploit and consider that the application will always behave normally to the victim's eyes so he won't know is actually being hacked I was going to show you a quick video demonstrating but there was some crash on our VLC player so I'll just move on to the corporate response so the response was good it was fast it was classified as a critical issue it was fixed there was no bounty because I think there was no bug bounty program at the time but there was some legal issues uh, this wasn't good uh, we could avoid this but We'll talk about this in the final words section and now I'll hand over to Pedro so that he'll talk to you about the Google Camera application. Pedro? Thanks, Sean. Now we are going to look into case number three, which is the Google Camera. Uh, the Google Camera app comes uh, installed on millions of different devices uh, and this was re a research that comes in the context of an audit to the Pixel 3. Sometimes instead of uh, looking into a specific application, we just choose a, a vendor and buy the, the latest phone and start to look into the pre-installed applications that come uh, since this implies a bigger attack surface and uh, more, more users that could be at risk. And in this case, we were focusing on the Google Camera app. Now, the the process is kind of the same when you do Android reversing for a while. You just you list the activities and uh, broadcast receivers and so forth that you can call without permissions. You reverse the APK, you analyze the traffic, you start reading the code. So, in this case, there was a lot of exported activities and defined actions inside the, the Google Camera app. Now. We started to test the behavior of these activities and actions and look for interesting stuff because sometimes it is, it's easier just to, to start and test the, the behavior of, of the application instead of reading tons of reversed uh, code, uh, sometimes obfuscated. So we noticed that uh, there's this action called video camera that starts the Google camera app and immediately starts recording and we found that uh, interesting because there is also this uh, action video capture that does not start recording. So why were there two different ones? Any other action would open the Google camera on, in photo mode, but does not take a picture. So we are looking like the attack scenario here is a rogue application that's trying to control the, the Google camera application. So we map out which classes handle which intents and which actions and then you start to read the code and try to figure out if, if there's any extras or data or uh, actions that you can uh, pass to the program and to the application and modifies the execution path uh, or the behavior, right? So we noticed at least three uh, interesting extras. One is called the uh, use front camera, which allows us to the controller app to choose if uh, the, the Google camera is going to use the front camera or the back camera. There was this uh, duration seconds, which allows the camera to start a timer before before taking a picture. And this obscure one called extra turn screen on, which essentially does what it, what it says it does. It turns the screen on. Now, why was this interesting? Because uh, the timer duration seconds, for example, starts the Google camera app and also starts the timer. So 
you you could take video uh, without user interaction and now we figure out a way to take a photo without user interaction if you use a timer the minimum default timer is uh, three seconds it's hard-coded but still you can take photos without user interaction and the uh, extra turn screen on was very I interesting because it makes the camera app to open even if the phone uh, is on standby or even if the smartphone is locked with a pin number so you can actually start from the background start the google camera and take a picture and record a video now why is this interesting because usually uh, the videos and the photos uh, are stored on in the sd card and the sd card I, as you know it's easily accessible by other applications that have the read external storage permission so we started to think how can we leverage this in a meaningful attack scenario right so and we devised with this combination now you, you can make a, a, a rogue app you know take a picture record a video without user interaction even if the phone is locked and the big problem here is that uh, this rogue app does not need permissions, does not need camera permissions. It just abuses the Google Camera app uh, to m take these uh, actions uh, for himself. So we, we devised a, a POC called Spixel. Uh, it's a, a client-server architecture. Like the, the client is a, a rogue weather app. Uh, it only needs the reader st external storage permissions and uh, the internet permissions to communicate with the command and control server. The command and control server is uh, listens for every client and has a bunch of uh, interesting features. Now, uh, it, the command and control server can uh, order the rogue app to take a photo or take a video from a so so chosen camera. It uses some stealth features that uh, we developed to prevent that the, the Google Camera app is popping up uh, or making a sound. Uh, we can mute the, all the audio streams. This was actu actually uh, another, another um, topic that we submitted to Google because it's not, it was not supposed to be possible to mute the phone without permissions to do so. Uh, and it's another bug. Uh, we monitor the proximity sensor to know if the phone is upside down or not, or, or you are on a call. Uh, we devise a feature called auto-record calls. Uh, when you answer the phone and you put the phone next to your face, it starts recording. Uh, and it's actually possible to listen conversations uh, in both sides. Uh, if exit data is uh, on, you can grab the GPS locations and locate the user, like you can issue the camera to take a photo, and then uh, parse the EXIF data and, and grab the GPS position. This is not uh, completely related to, to the vulnerability in itself, but uh, we, we kind of get creative and, and implemented uh, this on, on the tool, among the other features. So now we're going to see a demo. So this demo shows the auto-record feature when David answers. You can see on the right side the image Who's from calling? the camera, superimposed. And this is the attacker side when it actually receives the video and plays it back to the attacker uh, on the Spixel interface. So the corporate response here was uh, really, I think, standard for Google, which is uh, really high for everyone else. <laughs> so we, we got a, a medium-fast response after the first uh, report. Uh, this was classified as a medium-impact vulnerability. Then we shared our tool and an explanation of what we did and uh, how our tool could bypass a, a locked phone. And then they classified as a high-impact vulnerability. The response from now on, uh, from then on, was really, really fast. They they contact other vendors uh, that were identified as using the Google Camera or a, a byproduct of uh, Google Cameras and derivative. Uh, there were also other companies affected, and in the end, Google uh, granted a 75k uh, USD bounty, which was really cool. So now we reach our last case, which is case number four: Samsung Find My Mobile. 
Now, Find My Mobile is uh, an application that works together with a website that uh, uh, a Samsung account owner can use to locate his phone if it's lost. Uh, you just log into the website, make the phone ring, and lock the phone, and whatever. So this was researched in the context of an audit to a Samsung S8, uh, also uh, looking into default install applications uh, and try to figure out if there's some vulnerabilities there. Now, the process is kind of the same, just list the activities, uh, try to find that some, some things that are reachable by uh, other applications without permissions, reverse the APK, analyze the traffic, and so forth. There was not much luck involved at first, uh, but digging a bit deeper, uh, there's some piece of code that didn't even decompile correctly that uh, refers to a file in the SD card called fmm.prop. Now, this was an interesting file to, to know, and uh, after reversing, uh, it was possible to understand that the, the, the program would load the mg.url and dive URL from this file if the file existed. So this location, since it lives on the SD card, allows a, a malicious application to create this file and, and FMM will use it and will communicate with the backend M MG server. Well, there are going to be a lot of servers in, in, in this example, so the MG server is like the management server. And we can control it if we create this file and pass it a uh, URL that you want. But creating this file is not enough. Uh, you must force FMM to assume this file. Usually uh, this happens at boot up, but uh, it's not really interesting if you cannot control it. So this was vulnerability number one. And now vulnerability number two comes from uh, a broadcast receiver. So there's this, this broadcast receiver called PCW receiver that when it receives the action that registration was completed it will proceed to update the URLs so what what this ha what this uh, means in practice is that by uh, by uh, by us sending uh, a message to a broadcast message to this PCW receiver uh, FMM gets signal that the registration is completed and then it contacts the MG server to perform this registration again and this MLG server is the URL that we already under control in vulnerability number one. Now, this is interesting because uh, by pointing the NG URL to an attacker control server uh, and forcing this registration with vulnerability number two, we can get a lot of details uh, about the user because the phone contacts our own server and then we can get the course location via, via IP address, registration ID, uh, I may there's a lot of information that comes with this registration request and so joining these two vulnerabilities together we can effectively uh, found a way to uh, monitor a user uh, remotely uh, this all happens in background and uh, the user has no way of knowing this is uh, happening so but this is kind of not enough I, I didn't want just to monitor users I, I want I want more so by analyzing the M original MG server response, we can see that the response uh, comes with a lot of different URLs. There's like this DM server, DS server, OSP server. I didn't get to the, you know, the bottom of all servers, what they all uh, work uh, for and what they are for, but uh, it was nice to see that we can also control the other endpoints. And this allows us to go and talk about vulnerability number three. Now, the vulnerability number three exists in another receiver called the SPP receiver. And there's this magic action that you can see there that's FB, zero, B, D, uh, so hexadecimal uh, string that indicates uh, to FMM if there was a push, push message received. Now, by sending a broadcast with this magic, magic action, we can additionally add an extra with the, with the push, push messages. Uh, there was a lo lot of work involved in uh, reversing these messages. They are all encrypted and uh, it's kind of hard to, to read, but luckily the, the key was hard coded in, in, in the code and we don't even have to understand wh what are all these messages for. Uh, we just need to know if we can craft the proper message, then we can get FMM to talk with the DM server. Now, 
While the NG server seems for registration processes and delivering reports, the DM server uh, actually stores the actions that the user uh, performs when he logs into the website or to the web interface. Now, the website, uh, in, you can find it in findmymobile.samsung.com, has, has a, a map and has an overlay and the user can log in and perform, depending on the API level, you can perform a lot of actions. You can ring the phone, you can lock the phone and leave a message, uh, create a backup, retrieve call logs and SMSs, uh, erase all data on, on the phone. So there's a lot of uh, different actions that, that you can make on the web interface. Now, they are executed by the, f by the phone when the phone receives this, these messages but the phone could be uh, offline or, or somewhere without uh, network access. So it's possible for the attacker to send a broadcast to this SPP server that results in uh, FMM contact this DM server and, and searches for pending actions that were taken and FMM didn't have network connectivity to perform those actions. Now, this communication uses a, a proprietary SyncML implementation, which was a bit hard to figure out. Uh, it's it's not like standard SyncML to the best of my knowledge, and there's something called AUT MD5 on on this on this uh, communication. So I assume there was some kind of authentication going on and encryption. Uh, so what happens is it's when the FMM contacts the DM server. The DM server can just reply with a OK or the accumulated actions that were requested and missed while the smartphone was offline. And this is where you can come in because we actually, uh, because of vulnerability number two, we actually control the DM server. So we control the NG server and the DM server. But to be able to perform something uh, or, uh, like closely remotely resembling a man in the middle attack we need a valid certificate you need to monitor the messages you, you need to detect the message types change the requests on the fly and you have to bypass this sync ml out d5 mechanism at the same time to make everything works so now we are going into vulnerability number four which is the sync uh, out md5 uh, algorithm uh, so it has nothing to do with MD5 weaknesses. Uh, the authentication protocol seems to be like the client connects to the server and sends a, a field a sync ML out MD5 on the first request. I assume this is a challenge. The server responds uh, with another out MD5 field, which I it only depends on the client challenge, original client challenge in the IMA. I assume it's a response, and then the client now accepts all server replies from now on. Uh, why is this important? It's because there is no message signing on or any mechanism that uh, prevents message modification, which is really great for an attacker in the middle middle position. So, I you know you don't even need to reverse the the response verification mechanism to make this work. You can just man in the middle the connection and send the authentication, <coughs> the challenge packet to the server, uh, grab the response, send to the client, and then you can just use that token and communicate because there was, you can change the content of the packet because there was no, uh, you know, message signing. So, phew, putting it all together, if you put all these uh, vulnerabilities together, so with vulnerability number one, you can use the FMM prop file to change the NG server to your own server. Then you send a broadcast to the PCW server, receiver, and then uh, you can get the MG server that has all these actions stored uh, and force the update uh, via a spoof response. Then you send the, uh, another message, another broadcast message to the SPP server, receiver that actually makes FMM contact the DM server and fetches any outstanding actions. Uh, you are in the middle of this connection, so you just uh, forward back, uh, you forward the challenge uh, packet to the original server, uh, grab the response, and then inject your own actions in the client, since there's no message integrity here. And then the smartphone can actually execute whatever message you decide for him. So, you know, 
the too long didn't read version is that any application could re reset your phone, steal your messages, lock it, you know, lo locate the user, uh, anything that FMM supports, and depending on the API level, uh, any application without permissions, uh, ex except to, to actually use the SD card, uh, which is one of the most common permissions, you, you can do whatever that FMM supports. It works on a wide range of devices, including the S7, the S8, the S9 Plus. Uh, this was tested on, on a lot of devices. And uh, we have a demo that we can show now. So I can actually claim that I'm able to you know, erase all contents of the phone without actually showing it. So here's the server configuration uh, files. I'm going to uh, switch my action to nuke uh, this video is a bit uh, sketchy I'm sorry but I, I cannot record the the mobile phone uh, screen at the same time uh, so here's the Samsung S8 to unlock it <coughs> I'm going to start the, the POC and over here, I'm I'm telling the the logs of of the rogue server. So I'm going to do the exploit uh, step by step. This is the first step, which changes the FMM prop. This is the second step. As you can see here, uh, you can already uh, watch that the rogue server receives the register uh, requests. So the URL endpoints now should already be taken over here. And now when I'm going to do step 3, uh, it's, uh, FMM is going to contact the, um, the sync server, the DM server, and but it's already spoofed, so the reply would be will be a nuke. And you can see it happened in real time here, uh, and kabam. <laughs> Bye bye, dear S8. So, it's the same thing that happened on the other video, but the, the action is actually different. The action is, is the erase, so the phone gets erased. Also, the SD card uh, is formatted, so all that uh, in, the, in this phone yeah, is lost. Uh, that's it. Here you can see the different uh, steps here so there over here there's a step one then you get this is where the authentication gets uh, um, stolen from from the server the reply <coughs> to the to the phone is injected with um, with uh, to be wiped it's hard to see here but over here to be wiped and then uh, a series of steps that are needed to actually make the phone uh, <coughs> uh, erased so working with Samsung uh, in the Samsung bounty program they are very organized and they were they, they issued a fast fast response after the first report this was classified as a high impact vulnerability and then uh, we, re we realized there was a lot more to, into it. The, this this kind of uh, behavior affects many different parts, from the applicational part, uh, the web server part. Uh, there were some things that needed to change. It took some time until they, they could issue a proper fix. And they granted a 10K USD bounty. And in addition, there were some closely related uh, critical flaws that are not in the scope of this talk. It's not the application uh, side. Uh, so it was added a 25k USD bonus. So in the end, it was very, very nice. So this concludes our presentation. Uh, we tried to give you a variety of examples uh, of real uh, applications that faced uh, different problems like the lack of encryption, uh, problems in the web views, uh, legacy code, intents without permissions. These are all uh, different issues that sometimes are common to other uh, applications or some of them are very Android specific. 
before we go, we'd like to just say some some words. Uh, we really believe that we are trying to make the world just a slightly better place by, you know, identifying these vulnerabilities, making people overall a bit more safe while, while being online. Uh, luckily, we, we are paid for this research and we're not depending on bounties, but of course they are always appreciated. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the vulnerability complexity does not, you know, equal having a greater impact or more rewards. Sometimes you spend a lot of time uh, trying to develop a, a POC or a working POC and on a very complex issue. Uh, other times you just find a very simple bug that has a, a lot of impact and does you, you can usually get a higher reward if you are in it for the bounties. And the final word is that we are really a friend. We are not the enemy. We are trying to, to help uh, companies making a better product, sometimes products that we actually use and we have a, a complete interest in, in, in making the product better. And, you know, threats and lawyers are legal suits are really not necessary. We are, we are, we think of ourselves as friends and we are not trying to, to hurt the company's image or, or whatever in any way. So, uh, I think now we are going to be open for questions if anyone wants to ask something. Thank you.